Our next speaker is an exercise physiologist. His subject is the benefits of exercise in cancer prevention and recovery. Eric Durack. Thank you. Am I on? Yes. <clears throat> well, thank you, Norman. I, I wanted to let everyone know that uh, it's, it's been an interesting decade for me. I actually spoke at Cancer Control Conference about nine years ago, and it was one of the very first lectures that I did in the area of exercise and cancer. Well, a decade later, uh, we have a number of sites around the United States that we've developed, and I think this is my 89th or 90th lecture specifically on exercise and cancer over the last seven or eight years. And so I'm happy, to, I'm happy to be back at Cancer Control. And what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes is to give you what I consider to be the next revolution in cancer care. Uh, you, you've been out in the uh, exhibit halls. You've talked with a lot of people. There's a lot of folks who are involved with this uh, lecture, this conference in total, who are really interested in, in getting alternative therapies into what we would consider mainstream cancer care. And I believe that over the last decade, I have found one of the most intriguing ways to get a complementary therapy and also a preventive agent involved that is actually not only uh, accepted by mainstream oncology, but I I've actually done most of my lectures in the past decade at medical centers. So let's, let's start our, our lecture here, and I'm going to sort of run you through where I would like to go here in the next few minutes. I want to talk in bits and pieces in this lecture about the general benefits of exercise as it relates to cancer care. We're going to talk a little bit about some data. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the lectures uh, that I've given and some of the programs that we have across the United States. Uh, and we're going to sort of uh, put everything in the mix. I'm going to talk about the healthcare connection because I believe that exercise right now over the last decade can stand toe to toe with many other types of complementary therapies uh, as it relates to oncology. I want to talk about lifestyle modifications because one of the things that I have found out to be a, a relative truism is that when a cancer patient gets involved with an exercise program, you can bet that they're going to get involved with one or two or three other types of complementary cancer care. I'm going to talk about longevity and survivorship issues because as some members of the audience know, I started a program in Southern California 10 years ago, and I'm actually going to report to you the results of a, of a follow-up survey that I just completed two months ago that's followed the health status of these cancer patients for the past decade. And lastly, I'm going to talk about some sports heroes, because we've been hearing a little bit in the press these days about some cancer survivors who just happen to go back to their sports and do extremely well. So we'll get started on that. In 1994, in Santa Barbara, I started an exercise program for cancer patients. I had about seven or eight people in my first class. I had done work with other types of medical populations before, but I was petrified. And the reason was because there was really no medical literature or sports medical literature that really gave me a foundation to provide a safe and effective exercise program for these people. Uh, a couple years after I started that program, I gave my, one of my first lectures. Uh, actually, it was in Pasadena back then at the Cancer Control Society. And of course, in 1999, a gentleman named Lance Armstrong won the first of, I can't even count on one hand now, Tours to France. And I really have... I believe he has changed the scope of how people look at cancer survivorship. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, and here we are in 2004, and I always make a uh, pronouncement at most of my talks now. I believe that cancer wellness, cancer exercise programs are the new form of cardiac rehab. Over the past decade, the number of patients who have access to cardiac rehab has gone down but the number of patients who have access to cancer exercise and wellness programs has grown exponentially. Well, let's talk about some of these athletes. Not just Lance Armstrong, but the gentleman underneath him is, is named Steve Scott, who at uh, 40 years of age uh, was diagnosed with testicular cancer. He was the, one of the fastest milers in American history. He has broken the, the four-minute mile more than any runner in history. Uh, and right now, he's still at 47 years old, runs a mile at about 4.15, which isn't too bad. Um, the young lady on top of him is Peggy Fleming, along with Scott Hamilton and other athletes, 
have not only come back from their cancer diagnosis, but they have come back to perform at a very high level of athletic competition. Now, does that mean everybody in, our, in the audience here is going to go out and buy a bicycle and, and ride up the, you know, Mount Wilson on there? No, that's, that's not the point. But the point is, is most of you who have read Lance Armstrong's book know that he was diagnosed with, a, with basically a fatal type of cancer. And he has come back to really show the world that with, with his type of treatment and his type of exercise regime. And is he involved in complementary therapies? You bet. I mean, daily massage and all these other types of things. Uh, I think that he really took stock of his life and moved himself forward very, very well, as did all of these other people. Uh, Steve Scott, motivational speaker. Peggy Fleming does a lot of work for NABCO. Uh, they are now letting the world know that, yes, you can be involved with physical activity and exercise, even to a greater degree after your cancer diagnosis than before. Now, I apologize for this, uh, this slide. One of my heroes is a lady named Dr. Meryl Winningham, and her JPEG did not come up when I transferred. But Meryl Winningham was the very first researcher in the field of exercise physiology and as it relates to cancer care. She was a PhD and a nurse. Uh, she was basically, she was my mentor for a few years. Uh, she blended exercise physiology and cancer care, and I actually dedicate almost every lecture that I give to her uh, because she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1999, and sadly enough, she passed away in 2001 of advanced stage uh, breast cancer. But in my last conversation with her, she had a very interesting quote. She said, Eric, she said, don't let my research be forgotten. And I really take that to heart because we have now built on such a great foundation that she left us uh, over the last 20 years when she started doing the first research in the late 1970s. Well, let's talk a little bit about research. In the mid-90s, or early to mid-90s, when I started in this, in this uh, field of exercise and cancer, I told you I was petrified. I couldn't find more than a couple dozen studies, and most of them weren't any good. So I decided to, yeah, I was do my own research, but also talk with people who were doing things all over the world. Well, by last year, there were over 500 new studies published just in the field of exercise and cancer. So now we have probably, you know, 1,000 studies. Some of them are, are in epidemiology and prevention. Some of them are in th just general therapy and cancer recovery. But for the most part, what I see is that in the sports medicine field, in the epidemiology field, and in oncology, there is much more interest in why exercise does something to help people enhance their recovery process. Now, I didn't say that we help them live longer. I said it enhances their recovery process. Can we thank Lance Armstrong? I don't know. But I think that he and a lot of other people like him are kind of the genesis that are sort of pushing this forward. Um, now, when I was asked to give this lecture, Lorraine said to me, she said, you've got to talk about prevention. So I ask you all the question, can exercise prevent cancer? Well, if we talk about exercise in terms of reducing your risk of getting it in the first place, the answer would be yes. Why? Because since I gave my first lecture at Cancer Control Society, Dr. Leslie Bernstein, Dr. Inger Toon, and Dr. Rockhill all did multiple studies, epidemiology studies, looking at the effects of physical activity over time and the incidence rate of breast cancer. And you know what they came up with? If you exercise over a period of years, about three to four days a week of moderate physical activity, which could be gardening, walking, tennis, whatever, you may reduce your risk of getting breast cancer by 50% independent of your genetic status, your body weight, or other types of risk factors. That's a tremendous statistic. Now, is that just breast cancer? Well, no, because uh, as Dean Ornish just uh, uh, pointed out in a very recent study last year, you can also reduce colon and prostate cancers as well, not maybe 50%, but I'll take a 10 15% reduction in risk any day, as opposed to some uh, studies may show a 1% or a 2% risk reduction. These are very large numbers and very large populations of patients, so it's, it's pretty interesting if you're looking at it from my standpoint. Now, how does it, how does it affect uh, someone's preventive status? Well, possibly one of the big reasons is hormone status. We just heard something about IGF proteins, insulin uh, molecules, 
cortisol molecules, et cetera, these hormones, but also body weight. There was a real interesting study done about five years ago by uh, Christine Wells and her colleagues at University of Arizona, and they said, if you can modulate hormones in women, you may reduce your risk for most types of female cancers. And I'm going to say that with most people, if you can modulate your hormones through exercise, testosterone, insulin, cortisol, et cetera, you may have a tremendous impact on developing cancer even years down the road. Okay, can exercise improve your chances of ca full cancer recovery? Yes. Well, how is that possible? All right, we've heard just the last lecture about tumor markers. Well, I don't get, all, I don't get too fancy with this. I want to look at some basic elements. Exercise improves, improves blood flow. How do we know that? Because we sweat, because we're moving that blood and we're carrying that heat. We're also utilizing those hormones. If you're using testosterone to rebuild your muscle every night after exercise, it's not floating around your system causing problems with your prostate gland. Exercise increases your core body temperature. It changes your pH. You develop more carbon dioxide and, and muscle hypoxia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But probably the big thing is that exercise has been shown over and over again in the past six to seven years to have improvements over time in natural killer cell activity. Pretty convincing stuff as far as I'm concerned. We're knocking them off in a number of different areas. Now, exercise also improves quality of life. I'm going to get to that in, right in, in the next slide here, I hope. Yes, because most people, when you ask them when they're doing exercise, they say, well, this is like a support group. And I say, well, what do you mean? Well, they like to attend because in most of the Southern California programs, attendance level is almost 70%. I'm going to ask you folks, you go to any health club in, in the Los Angeles area and you ask their staff how many people attend over the course of a year at 70%. They're going to say nobody because the attrition rate is about 50% as of March or April. Participants feel an improved social aspects of the program. You know why? Because instead of going to a health club with no hair and having people look at you, you get a chance to go in a class with people who also don't have any hair, and they have really cool wigs or hats, and you guys get something that you can talk about, and you're improving your health by doing exercise. And also, I've surveyed people. The last seven years, I've actually conducted follow-up surveys with people, and I asked them, how are you feeling? And they say, you know what? That exercise program, it's just like a support group. So I say that might be one of the most important aspects, is one of the ones that we actually can't measure in a test tube, is how well people believe in their exercise program. Well, what makes exercise so darn important for cancer patients? Because when I survey them, and I've done actually a national survey three years ago, I published a national survey, most cancer patients even immediately after breast surgery, prostate cancer surgery, whatever, do not have physical therapy, which I think is a shame. I think that 90% of them should have some level of acute therapy. Well, if they don't, they might be able to at least go to a community exercise program and accrue some benefits there, all right? One of the things we found out, and also what's published in most of the literature, is that exercise has the ability to reduce chronic fatigue in patients by almost 30%, which is, again, that's a big number, okay? Exercise programs can be implemented in any type of facility, all right? Over the last few years, I've developed a continuing education program, and I go all over the United States now, and I give my own workshops. We have programs in YMCAs, health clubs, Jewish community centers, recreation centers, and hospital-based wellness centers, of which there are almost a thousand in the United States, by the way. The hospital wellness uh, facilities are growing at a very rapid rate. Well, over the past three years, we have about 400 cancer wellness programs across the U.S. alone. That's a pretty big number, considering this is a grassroots type of a campaign. And a lot of these people are just doing extremely well. Some of them have hundreds and hundreds of patients that come through every year. Most of these programs, in terms of how they get paid for, are paid for by patients. They say, hey, this is a good program. Uh, it's $99 or $129. I can pay for that. So they'll pay a certain amount for a, a program. And then they may join the health club or the YMCA as a dues-paying member after that. However, what we're seeing in the past couple years, especially by virtue of the amount of grant funding that's increased, is we're seeing about 
of these programs are now being funded by foundations like the Susan G. Komen Foundation and the Lance Armstrong Foundation, which is the only um, foundation in the United States that I know of that has a grant specific to exercise and cancer recovery. And to this date, about seven or eight of the facilities in my network the past year have actually received between twenty dollars and $75,000 a year for such program. I think that's also terrific. We have some pharmaceutical companies that sponsor these programs, like Orthobiotech. Uh, they do a great job. They don't spend a lot of money, but I think it's a step in the right direction. And one of the things that I'm interested in doing, which I'm going to share with you in the next slide, is uh, we're in the process this fall of negotiating with some HMOs uh, to get some contracts for cancer wellness programs, similar to the current programs that are reimbursed through the Silver Sneakers uh, Senior Wellness Program and another therapy program that's in upstate New York. I believe that this is going to be the future of cancer wellness programs because once we can get our first uh, HMO, our first private insurance company to pay for these types of programs, we're going to see it go all over the United States. Why? Because HMOs already pay for these types of services. In Tempe, Arizona, Silver Sneakers program has been underway for seven or eight years. They do over twenty million dollars a year in HMO payments for seniors so they can go exercise in a health club. If they can go do that with their program, they can do that with cancer wellness. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of uh, upstate New York has been paying for therapy, therapeutic exercise programs now for three years based on a, a, a workers' comp contract. I believe that they will actually pay for this type of service as well. Uh, we have actually have outcomes mechanisms. We've published a lot of research on our previous work, and we're working with some state organizations to contract for services in the following states next year, California, Arizona, Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee, Arkansas, and Colorado. Why did I choose these states? Because they have the largest number of cancer wellness programs within them. Well, let's talk a little bit about specific protocols. If you're a woman with breast cancer and you go into a health club, what are you going to ask your trainer? Well, first off, you're going to ask if they know anything about exercise and cancer. Are they certified in this area? There's two or three uh, companies that actually do certifications. Uh, and you want them to understand a little bit about your problems that you've had based on the surgery in uh, the shoulder girdle, what types of exercise and stretches that you can do. For prostate cancer, most men will obviously not want to be sitting on those Tour de France bicycles right after their cryo surgery because it would not be a very good idea. Actually, they're not very comfortable even if you've never had any surgery. But anyway, but you, but you really want to look for pain status and lack of conditioning because a person can, undergoing chemotherapy actually has the same symptoms as someone who's in over, who is chronically overtrained. They have chronic fatigue, uh, their heart rate is elevated, they have muscular weakness, they have joint pain, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the same as someone who, who works out too hard over a long period of time. So basically what we do and what I lecture on with all of my personal trainers and therapists, I say you should, you should look at exercise training in three very simple, basic phases. Number one is movement. We want to make sure that a person can do stretches, uh, that they can do uh, daily activity movements with little or no pain. Once they master that phase of their exercise component, which may only be a day or two, then we go into something like strength training, where we teach them how to lift dumbbells or the rubber cords that you have right here or uh, some of the specialty machines that are out there. And then once they actually can develop their own exercise program, then they'll go onto a self-paced program. They can do this at home. They can do it at a health club. But as long as they've mastered those three basic phases, they basically have an exercise program that they can do for life. And that's what we're starting to see as we're doing all of our follow-up research over the past 10 years. Now, I've got one more thing that didn't, didn't fly in here, too. This was just a picture of someone who had lymphedema. One of the most exciting areas that I came across when I started doing both my local and my national surveys was the effect of exercise on lymphedema status. I think it's the most important part of exercise because we'll, some will say, well, how do we know that exercise really works? And I'm going to say, well, what's the average percentage of women who get lymphedema over five or ten years? Well, it may be three percent, six percent, twelve percent. No one really knows. I can tell you that over ten years with our program, our lymphedema rate is 1.5 percent. 
over 10 years. In other words, most women who maintain good body weight, who exercise regularly, combination of strength training and aerobics, their odds of getting lymphedema are almost zero. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, more detail in the next slide. But basically, one of the things that I think is the most important is that they reduce their weight. I think one of the biggest risk factors in getting lymphedema in the first place is, is gaining weight after your cancer diagnosis. Well, if exercise can help you maintain body weight and blood flow and all the other great things that I talked about, and you can reduce that, the, the overall fat status, I think that's going to play a major role in preventing lymphedema. If you exercise over time, you increase maybe the collateral circulation in your lymphatic system. And Dr. Cindy Falzer from the University of Michigan just did a sabbatical at the NIH two years ago. And she did a research in what's called lymphoscintonography. Don't ask me to spell it. But anyway, lymphoscintonography will look at the number and the flow mechanisms of the lymphatic system. And she says with long-term exercise and rehab, you actually gain collateral circulation in the lymph nodes, similar to what cardiac patients do when they exercise over years after they've had their heart attacks. Amazing! So exercise has some physiological mechanisms, not just, you know, this feel good, people like social interaction, and they're going to exercise with all their friends. This is some really rock hard, solid evidence that says that this may work over long periods of time. I also personally believe, after traveling to hundreds of centers across the United States, that the best possible training method is, is strength training, resistance exercise, and aerobic training they seem to have the best possible results. And lastly, someone asked me, well, when should you start doing exercise? If you're a woman with breast cancer, should you wait a year? Should you wait two years? I say you should probably engage in exercise on your second uh, cycle of chemotherapy. That way your body is actually trying to handle the chemotherapy as well as uh, just being deconditioned. So you can actually have a longer period of time to exercise, to actually reduce weight, improve strength, increase your aerobics, et cetera, et cetera. One of the most important things that I feel exercise is going to deliver in terms of health care and the health care connection is its role in outcomes. Now, I got lucky. In 1994, when I started my exercise program in Southern California, I was smart enough, I guess, to have these patients all fill out a real simple health questionnaire. And 10 years later, I'm still calling them on the phone, and I'm asking them some questions as well. So I've been able to track the health status of patients, not just the 10 weeks. That's going to be looking at their strength and their aerobics and their flexibility and all that stuff. But we also do follow-up surveys every year or every other year on the telephone. And the next slide that I have, I'm going to talk about a 10-year follow-up survey that I just completed this summer. Lastly, I've worked with a company in Colorado called Orion Outcomes Software. They are the largest producer of cardiac rehab software in the United States. We just produced our first CD-ROM that will detail uh, benchmarking and outcomes data on any cancer patient anywhere in the United States if the hospital will, would buy the software. So that's another avenue to let doctors and insurance companies know that this program actually has some teeth to it. It has merit because over time we see that patients are doing well. Okay? And I've also published a few uh, sports medicine journals. Now how can patients learn more about exercise? Number one, talk with your doctor about exercise. Patients need to know, I got three minutes Norman, <laughs> patients need to know that their doctor knows something about exercise. And you say, hey, I want to go to a YMCA. I would like to engage in an exercise program. Here's something that I got on the internet. What do you think about this? You should also contact a local health club or a YMCA and ask them, do you have a program for seniors? Do you have a fitness therapy program? And lo and behold, you might even have an exercise program for cancer patients. There are about 27 or 28 programs right here in California. Half of those are probably right here in the Los Angeles basin. You should go to Amazon.com and look up some of the new publications. There's three books published this year alone in exercise and cancer. And of course, my website, I have some information and articles on just some of the basics of exercise and cancer uh, from the standpoint of our network and, and just some of the new things that are, that are happening. I also have a newsletter for a lot of people as well, too. 
Oncologists are interested in exercise. They don't know a heck of a lot about it, but they would be willing to refer if, if patients had some information from them. Um, if, if trainers and nurses wanted to have an exercise program at their hospital, they would want to develop an information pack. And one of the things I found very successful is to work with nurses and support group people because they're much more apt to refer than most doctors are. And lastly, I just take it to the patients. I like to make a lot of phone calls and have patients themselves uh, come to a lecture, uh, come to one of the support group meetings, and you might be able to get them to exercise just by talking with them about the benefits. And in my last minute, we've got about two slides left here. My goal, and hopefully the next time that I speak at Cancer Control, I will be able to detail the results of our healthcare connection. Uh, this program should be promoted as a healthcare program. This is not just about personal training. This isn't about slide or step classes at the local health club. This is a bona fide health care program. It's safe and effective. Over the last 10 years, I've surveyed cancer patients. We, out of the 30,000 exercise hours that we've detailed, we have not had one injury. And some of these people are stage 3 and stage 4 cancer patients. Um, we measure. We keep good records. Uh, we do outcomes in this program. That's why it's successful. And when we need to, we will refer to other cancer uh, or other health professionals. Um, when we did our survey, we looked at 50 patients. Almost all of them, 74%, are still exercising at 10 years, and 80% take vitamins. Their score on 1 to 10, 8.1. That's how well they're doing uh, at this point in time. And hardly any of them have lymphedema, as I mentioned, and none of them have any adverse health care expenditures. So in my estimation, over 10 years, we're looking at a very healthy population of cancer survivors. And in conclusion, there are thousands who are participating. Local health clubs and YMCAs are the distribution centers. And cardiac rehab of this, this decade, I believe, is going to be cancer wellness. So I thank Cancer Control Society. If anyone has any other questions, I'll be right outside after we're done. I appreciate your time. Thank you much. Thank you, Eric.